thank you, everyone, um, for, for coming by today. Thanks for the, for the previous speaker. That was really great stuff. I'm going to dig into Ray later. I want to actually check out whether we can plug in Neo4j into that whole uh, framework. That sounds like it'll be a lot of fun to do. So wherever you've gone, let's tag team on that later on. Let's, let's get that going. I'm going to talk to you, though, about, like, in terms of like LLMs and the entire universe, what we're doing with GenAI. I'm in the world of RAG, and on the database side, Neo4j is a database. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, LLM and graph databases for RAG. And really, the entire talk comes down to this. This whole idea about having graphs inside of a RAG workflow is putting RAG in context. Heard a little bit of context in the previous talk. It's always a part of what you think about when you're building RAG solutions. And what I mean about it is something very particular in terms of graphs. This is another, you've probably seen a million variations of this diagram basically at this point. This is the basic RAG flow. Somewhere there's an application that takes input from a user, sends it to the LM, gets the answer back. We saw a version of that in the previous slide, pre pre previous presentation. Same idea. The extended version of this, which you also saw a version of in the previous talk, is when you go ahead and you don't just take the user's input, maybe do some prompt engineering and then pass it to the LM. You actually talk to a data source of some kind first, package up information from that data source to provide a bigger context that hopefully is relevant to the user's question, then pass it back to the LLM, and then the user gets an answer. Okay, that's the full RAG round trip. Everyone has seen this a million times, right? Has anyone? Okay, yeah, we're all on board here. Okay, this is all the easy stuff. This is where it starts for me to get a little bit less well explored, because we tend to fixate on the LLM side, fine tuning the LLM, getting the right LLM also, pick, picking the right model. And even on like the, the database side, to be honest, like what does the model actually look like? But when you think about actually building end user applications, it, it isn't just those two things that matter. It's not just the LLM and just the database and maybe just the orchestration framework. You wanna think about the full stack of information, where it's available, what's available, and what is relevant. Because as we know from the memes, the person who's asking a question of an LLM, the way you phrase the question changes the answers you get. The same is true when you're doing vector search. How you phrase something might end up getting different results. And so you actually want to end up building solutions that takes into account that there's some user that maybe you know something about, and maybe that user actually knows something about what they're asking. And then, of course, you're building an application that hopefully does have some of that information about the user. So taking that into account while you're doing your round trips. Then, of course, the database itself knows something about some domain. And then the LLM itself knows either whatever it found on the internet or whatever you have trained it on. Uh, that's what its expertise is around. You want to take all of that into account when you're building end-to-end -end applications for sure, and I'm going to get into some of the nuance of that as we talk through. I'm a software developer at heart, so I'm not I'm a data scientist or an ML person, so you're going to have to excuse some of my software biases as I go through this. But for me, this is the part that I can control. I can control the application. I can control the database. People in this room, some of you control the LLM, build the LLM. That is not my world. That's a separate conversation. I'm going to focus on this middle bit. And when I think about that middle bit, um, immediately I start to think, bucket, like, what kinds of information I have? Because depending on the kind of information I have, what I can do with it changes. And that's what I'm going to talk through next. There's these three sources I talk about. And you've heard these terms before. I call it pure text. More generally, this is unstructured data that where this is where you're talking to your PDF. OK, great. You've got some unstructured data. There's information in a bunch of a corpus of text, whether it's PDFs, text files, whatever it might be, maybe even just multimedia files, like videos, and things as well. Fine. That's the pure text world of information that's available. When you're building an application that you think of that as being your only extra source of information, what you're really doing is building a system for information search. It's information retrieval. In computer science terms, it's still information retrieval. That's the R part of it, right? But very particularly, this is just searching for information. You're hoping that for the user's question, there's a good mirror of the answer in the data somewhere. And so you're just going to do a search. And there's different techniques, of course, for doing that search, including, including of course, vector. So if you had business data, you could ask questions like, OK, what is Apple's primary business? Hopefully somewhere in the text, it says something like, oh, Apple's primary business is whatever it is. You find that, you pass it back to the LLM, come up with an answer. Way on the other side, and this is less commonly, I guess, where people start. But for enterprises, people have heard of things like data warehouses and data lake houses and lake warehouses, all the different variations. 
you already have data, not unstructured data, but structured data, in a database somewhere, and you also would like to query that. The approaches you have for querying that are different than when you've got unstructured data, right? You already have query languages around, and so the approach, of course, you take is rather than, hey, let me take the user's question, turn that into a vector embedding, do a similarity search, you start with, okay, let's see if we can take the user's question and generate a query, SQL, or for us, uh, Cypher query language is a graph query language, from that natural language, run that, get an answer, again, hand it to the LLM, get that packaged up to something that looks like Shakespearean prose, right? Ultimately, that's what you want. Shakespearean prose of how many iPhones Apple sold last quarter. What's awesome about this is if you know techniques on the left-hand side, you know techniques on the right-hand side, you can combine them, and then you can get kind of the best of both worlds. You can do some vector search stuff, you can do some text to query language stuff, and you can combine these techniques for querying across all the different data that you have accessible to you. Kind of out in the wild, this naturally occurs if you happen to be running a WordPress site. You've got a lot of text, which is really great for vector search, and then you've got a lot of structured data around that text as well. You actually want to combine those two available data structures, the unstructured and the structured structure, um, in your queries. And so this ends up being opening up, actually, it's not only that it's a different source, the kinds of questions you can ask end up being qualitatively different. It's not just searching for something or turning a, a natural language question into a query and running that. It ends up being information discovery, where you kind of know a little bits and pieces of what's going on, and you're trying to bring it all together into a relevant context that you're packaging up into a prompt and then passing to the LLM. So you're combining things at this point. When you bring this all together in one kind of unified data model, that's what ends up being a knowledge graph. So for me, this is my definition of a knowledge graph. Um, there are a million definitions of knowledge graphs. Probably everybody who's ever done anything with so the semantic web or any kind of uh, graph whatsoever will have their own version of what this is. For me, I think about a knowledge graph as just being an information architecture. Um, for data using graph structures. Basically that simple. And of course, within Gen AI, the whole goal of this, the reason that you might want to do that, is for placing all their information you might find within a context that matters. Both for getting better answers, but also for ranking those answers. So both expanding the context and also then ranking the context. The access patterns you end up coming up with when you're working with a knowledge graph, broadly the umbrella term is graph frag. Graph frag, as with knowledge graphs and everything else, will mean lots of different things to whoever's doing this kind of work, but the umbrella term is assuming that you've got something that looks like a graph, here's the different access patterns you can use for accessing that graph in a RAG application. So graph frag. The techniques under the hood, of course, as I've already kind of talked through, if it's just text, you're probably gonna start with vector search. That's the reliable way to go. You always start with that. On the data side, it's the text to query language generation. Start with that. And in the middle, it's a, well, it kind of depends. You actually have to do a little bit of you know, thinking here, not a little bit. There ends up being a lot of art here driven by the kinds of questions you're trying to ask that fail to be answered on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. You start to look at how can I combine these two things to be able to answer those questions. So again, kind of in a software developer's mindset, this is test-driven development for me. So for, in, in this context, this is really eval-driven development, you continue to evaluate what the questions that you can ask are, actually what your possible questions are, and when you run into boundaries, not only are you getting good answers, but like bad answers, but answers that are not possible, at that point, you're like, okay, let me change my approach to see whether it's possible to answer that question in some way using a combination of these techniques. To make this a bit more concrete, my go-to example, and that I have some, some notebooks around, uh, pulls from the SEC's Edgar database. The Edgar database is the public database where SEC filings become available to the public. Um, this is the stuff that, if you're a publicly traded company, you've got a file with the SEC, it ends up in this database. Also, if you are a large management uh, company that's, you've got a large portfolio of investments, you also have to report what you're investing in. So what the company is, how much the dollar amount was, and how many shares, those kinds of things. So using this data set, using the, actually these two forms, it's the, the Form 10K and the Form 13s, the Form 10Ks end up being really great for just text, so for the unstructured data. We just go ahead and pre-process all of that and 
as you all are probably very familiar, even that step is easy to just say, but it's the devil in the details there is just ridiculous. If you go off and look at the, like, the raw data you get from the SEC, it is just a big mess of awful XML, and trying to pick out the bits and pieces that you want to is non-trivial. That's another night's talk that maybe I'm not gonna give, and hopefully somebody else is gonna give. I'm gonna ignore that. Let's assume somebody else has taken care of all the data preparation. You've got the relevant text out. That becomes what we're gonna do vector search with. The other form, the form 13s, uh, also has text, but we kind of care less about that text, at least you know, I, I did when we put this all together. What I cared about was simply the, the data of like who's the company, who's the management investment company, and how much did they invest in some public company. Take that, we actually ended up generating a giant CSV file out of that, that became a structured data that we then linked to the unstructured data. That ends up being the overall data set. The philosophical approach I have for doing this data modeling is different, I think, um, and generally this is true for, for graphs. It, it is very different than how you're used to doing relational data modeling. If you're used to doing relational data modeling, you end up with a relational mindset trying to anticipate all the things that might be necessary and building out a really beautiful schema. And then slowly over time that schema gets destroyed as you have new queries that can't run or that run slowly or whatever that is, right? With a graph, you don't take that approach. With a graph, I recommend taking an approach of saying, let me build the smallest thing possible that is useful, the minimum viable graph that I can ask some questions of. And then at the point where I run out of questions that I can ask, then I elaborate on that. And so start with a small graph, pick out interesting information, enhance that information, find out if there's some dimension that you can basically add an index for, and then connect it. That is the tiniest graph you can create. In this data set, it ends up being take that text, do the classic text splitting, create a bunch of chunks. And this is not actual uh, Form 10K data, this is lorem ipsum. Apologies about that. Um, my copy-paste skills are poor, so that was easier to do. The natural thing to do with text, of course, is go ahead and then do a vector embedding for all of those, store both the vector embeddings and the text into the graph. At this point, you already have a legitimate graph. It doesn't have edges, it doesn't have what we call relationships in, in kind of knowledge graph land, but it's already a graph because you've got it in nodes. These nodes are backed by an index, so you can do the vector search, so that's already pretty nice. But to make it a slightly bit graphy without getting too crazy with designing a whole graph around this, the easiest thing you can do at this step is just making a linked list. You know that the chunks came in order, preserve the order. Why throw away information? The easiest way to do that is just say, okay, great, this chunk follows this chunk, follows this chunk, have a series of next relationships across the chunks. So this is the, the pattern that I you know, had a couple slides ago. Create some records, enhance the records, connect the things. Repeat, repeat, repeat until you get to a place where you're happy. Even at this stage, there's two things that are nice about this. Um, for doing just vector search, you still land on chunks as you normally would, but because you're in a linked list, you have an arbitrary kind of chunk window that you can pick. You can go before and after this just by following out the linked list, grab that stuff up, hand that back into the context, and off you go. As you know, and I think as, as the previous speaker mentioned, how much chunking is the right, like how big are the chunks, how big are the windows, completely depends on the data set. What we have actually here in these, this example that uh, I've worked on, our chunk size is completely arbitrary. We're like, I, I don't know what's relevant here. Let's do 2,000 characters, that kind of thing. Um, typically with this pattern, you also, you don't do any chunk overlaps if you're gonna have a linked list because if you want overlaps, you just increase the chunk window. Oh, right, the, the other kind of quality of this is, and this goes all the way back to my earlier slide about keeping the end user in mind. Uh, the point of this isn't just to help extend the knowledge available to an LLM, but to give good answers to a user. And so for the user, they might want to know not only how does the LLM turn this into Shakespearean prose, what was the original text, not just a pointer to the text, but here's the original text that was there. And in kind of boring UI terms, can you go to the next chunk and previous chunk? Now that you've got them in a nice length list, you can just combine a sort of chatty interface with a more traditional, let me just page through the data interface. It's up to you to design like what is appropriate for your context. Following the kind of iterative pattern here, the next step that is 
remarkably useful, but often underappreciated. Um, and you'll see it in most of the kind of orchestration frameworks. There's some, some version of this. Don't just have the chunks. Realize those chunks came from a document originally. All the chunks could have metadata about that document, but really the metadata belongs to the parent document. So go ahead and create that parent document. And then in the graph, just recreate the structures so that from each of the chunks, you can get to the parent. And here there's a parent relationship that the section relationship points to the head of the list. So if you're navigating from the form back down to the chunks, you can get to the head and kind of go through it. And along the way, this is a great opportunity to actually do a text summary. Take all those chunks, run a summary through the LOM, store that with a vector embedding on the form. You now have at least two different options for doing search. You can do on the chunk level granularity, or because you've got a summary, some questions might be better answered by that summary. And of course, might be wrong because you're trusting an LM to generate it and depending on all the things. Nevertheless, you've got new options available to you here. So there's already some nice strategies that become uh, possible. Turning over to the structured data side of things, um, this is also a very simple graph, but reasonable for the data set that we have. Uh, the badly named manager nodes are the investment companies. And then the company nodes are just the publicly traded companies. But so these management companies have invested some amount of stock. They own some stock in these public companies. So just go ahead and create that in the graph as well. Again, this is just reading from a CSV file in the, in the data set that I have the demo. Um, there are values you'll notice both on the nodes but also on the edge itself. The relationship itself can carry arbitrary properties. Um, so here it's the, what the number of shares are and what the value of those shares are. That gets put into the edge. And kind of, you know, maybe surprisingly, there's no reason to put a vector search on like the names of the companies. You could do that, but you don't really want conceptually similar company names. You want textually similar company names. That's really a full text search, not a vector search. So you do have a full text index on, on both of the, the names for the companies and the investment firms. This is on the structured data side. This already you know, opens up again. This is now the third, I guess, option of like access patterns that you can have. You can already start to query this from natural language. This is what I alluded to earlier in, in the, the, the deck, where this is take natural language, turn that into a, a, a query, run the query, get those results. For us, you'll notice here in one of the, one of the dots is a pattern matching. So in the graph query language, in, in Cypher, which is now, as of last week, an ISO standard. So great for us. Now there's SQL and the unfortunately named GQL. So sorry, GraphQL, we're going to have a, a name battle out in the wild. Um, but let's just call it Cypher for now. The, the premise of that query language, of the graph query language, the entire idea is do pattern matching. And it's pattern matching across records that if you had a relational database, you could still do this kind of stuff. Relational databases and also SQL, the query language is really optimized for within a table. Let, let me do operations there. You can do a join to another table, but it's really awkward to do many joins and express that in a nice way. A graph query language basically turns that on its side a little bit and is optimized for going across tables is one way to think about it. As soon as you start to think about how records, how you do queries across tables as the primary way of accessing, what results is that you end up describing patterns of records that you're looking for. That's what the query looks like and I'll show some examples later on. Here the simple pattern would be find me patterns of a manager who owns stock in some company and then you've got like a where predicate that you can add for like what's the name of the company or what's the name of the investment firm or maybe you're limiting it by the, the amount of the dollar investment or something like that. But it's kind of SQL-like at that point. Okay, uh, the one more step of elaboration that I ended up going through with this particular data set. Because I have addresses for, for the, each of these entities, pull those addresses out because now we get to ask questions about nearness, which uh, again is awkward to ask about in vector search unless you happen to have a document somewhere that talks about companies that are you know, co-located. Um, really easy to do in a geospatial search. It is just like vector search, but like with you know, two dimensions. So you know, X and Y are Latin long. Still basically vector search, right? So kind of maybe it is still vector. But you pull those out into separate nodes. Now you can do both pattern matching through location if you'd like to do that, or you can do nearness like within 50 kilometers or you know, whatever the criteria might be. So that's yet another option for doing queries on the data set. 
this lets us get to the point finally where we've got some structured data that we can do some interesting things with. We have unstructured data that we can do kind of typical RAG things with. Connect those together. We know that these companies have filed those forms, make that final connection. And now all of the different individual access patterns that are possible, you have the great pleasure of trying to decide how to choose which strategy at which time for the given user's question. That is amazing because you've got many options. That is annoying because you have so many options. And like doing a perfect mapping is a non-trivial task. The thing that ends up happening there, you've got two kind of main strategies for the strategy, I suppose. You either reduce the kinds of questions you want to ask and have them be, here's the things that we're going to allow and have those be really good. Or if you want to open it up to any kinds of questions and don't want to shrug your shoulders, you're going to have to do a lot of like round trips of like strategies, basically going round trip with the LLM and kind of an agentic type workflow saying, hey, for this question, and given these tools that are available, these agents that are available, what's the right strategy for answering this question? And then there's a bunch of subflows that end up happening there, any of which I'm happy to talk through, all of which are awesome and annoying because there's so many things to do. OK, this is the summary slide of the, what would be called the, the, the knowledge graph construction that I just went through, from just chunks to elaborating on that, slowly growing a graph around it, each time going through this same kind of process. Create some data, enhance the data, connect it to things, either connected to itself or connected it to things that already exist. Keep going like that, again, until you can answer all the things you want to. This goes on as much as you'd like. What is, again, both awesome and sometimes frustrating about a graph is there's no natural boundaries to it as much as you'd like to put into it, as much as is appropriate and useful for you to put into it. You just keep glomming things in. That is amazing. It's a temptation that you should resist. As in the same way that I recommend you start with a smallest graph that is reasonable, I also recommend that you resist growing the graph bigger than is necessary for what you're trying to get done. Focus on what you're trying to get done for, for the end user. But the possibilities end up being, I didn't do anything like this yet, right? You can still do like name density recognition from all the uh, unstructured data. Go ahead and like pull out the people, places, and things into the structured data as well. Connect things through that. In this particular example and many other sort of legislative-like examples, there are often cross-document links that are explicit. Great. Pull those out as well. Have the chunks themselves connected to each other. And then maybe do some post-processing, do some page rank on that. Now you know which chunks are the, the most influential chunks in the kind of corpus, right? All of that information, the more you add to the graph, there are a few things that are interesting about that. Like I've been talking mostly about the different access patterns that become possible. Also within the access patterns, you get new opportunities for ranking, basically. Like running the page rank is a good example of that. If you end up with, if you have a million chunks and you know, you're getting, uh, your top K is like 100, they're going to be 100 of the same thing that's maybe not the most useful. But if you then like take 1,000 and use page rank on that, actually maybe your 100, top 100 is going to be more useful then, right? Because um, you want not only what is most similar, but it's what is most relevant and useful, not just most similar. Most similar itself is just one criteria for picking what's helpful for answering the question. Um, add in the user data, keep the user's history, keep the user's memory, as, as some of the frameworks like to talk about. And along the way, give the user a chance for feedback. Record the feedback, and again, use that for enriching the graph so that over time, as a particular user uses the application that you're building, for that user, it continues to improve. Possibly for all users, it continues to improve. This is, to some degree, the mechanical Turk of, of labeling, of course. Let your users curate the data just by using the data and saying that was a terrible answer. ChatGPT does this. Why shouldn't we all do this as part of our apps, right? Thumbs up, thumbs down is enough to kind of help things out. OK, um, I'm going to switch over to some notebooks to give a quick look at like what the code looks like, quick preview of what the, the, the cipher looks like for doing queries with the graph query language. Um, before I do that, I'll give you a chance to take a look. So it's the top bit there is the notebook that I'm going to look at. In true demo fashion style, um, I was sitting on the couch there, you know, kind of trying to run through my notebooks and realized that I had broken the data model, and some of my queries are broken. Um, I'm going to run them anyway, and we'll see what we get. Some of them will work, some of them will not work. Uh, I apologize for that. It is live code, um, and that is the nature of the beast. Before I do that, though, I do want to take, is it okay to take a couple minutes right now to get some questions before I get into the demo? 
Is that cool? Okay. The one for the recording. So oh, I'm going to give you a sandwich, please don't separate it. Okay? Cool. Thank you. Um, okay. Factor databases uh, usually have some tricks for uh, high dimensional data. Um, do graph databases do the same thing? Like how to transform high dimensional data into lower dimensions? So for, what do you mean by transforming exactly at this point? Uh, lower dimensional data. Yeah, so and it ends pro projections, specifically. Yeah. So um, with a graph, you end up with kind of both strategies. A lot of it ends up being a data modeling strategy for like how granular you want your nodes to be, like whether they're very fine-grained or they're big, chunky nodes. Um, because the chunkier they are, then when you're doing pattern matching rather than vector search, that affects the granularity of like what kinds of questions you can ask. Is, is that what you're getting at? Like for the, no. or uh, specifically the vector indexing uh, is it has few tricks to enhance the performance, because if you deal with all the dimensions in in vector uh, vector data vector embeddings, you're gonna get really complicated uh, index. But they transform that into lower dimensions, uh, losing, it's a lossy transform, but it's still fast. And right. I'm wondering if Neo4j or any kind of crap database, does it have anything like that up, up its sleeve? Any, such yeah, tricks? So, so I guess that's what I mean, and like it's not as, as directly applicable, like in the, when you're doing the graph modeling, so like the graph query time performance ends up being um, directly proportional to the number of relationships that you have to touch. And so the bigger, the bigger the nodes are, the fewer relationships you have to touch to satisfy a pattern, and so that ends up being faster to execute. The, and I guess the other dimension of that, or the, the other aspect of that, is that the overall data set doesn't affect the query performance. Query performance is entirely perform, determined by like locality of the data. So like the number of like people that we know between us doesn't change, then the query time for finding like how many people we have in common doesn't change. What does change is if you've restructured the, the graph and have a lot of extra nodes in between us, that impacts query time performance. So that's what I meant by having like kind of, either you can kind of flatten out a graph and have like what amounts to like a triple store like representation of things, right? And it's like very fine grained concept to concept to concept to concept to concept. That is slow and slow and slow because you gotta kind of reassemble things and that takes more time. So by, so for us we have what's called the property graph model. By bundling things up, you can perform better. But then we get into kind of the relational world of like, okay, how much do you want to be bundled? How much, you know, and how, how much, how well that maps to natural language questions as well. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, question. It seems like you've, you've created an architecture where I could present both the ability to do a cipher query as well as just allowing the user to do a prompt. Right, a, a query and just a normal query. Yeah. Do you do you see a, a scenario where the the LLM could actually generate the query, the the cipher query as well? Oh yeah. So like in when I switch over to the notebooks, th that's one of the things that we do. So whether you just do it without any training at all, and you just say, hey, here's natural language, generate a cipher query. There's enough examples of cipher query out in the wild that um, even GPT 3.5 Turbo does a decent job of generating cipher. It is important to pass in the schema, at least in the prompt, like, hey, given this schema, and this user question, can you generate a query? For pattern match level queries, usually pretty okay. Um, as it gets more complicated, then it tends to break down, and is definitely helped a whole lot by few shot learning. So if you have like a bunch of examples, given this question, here's a query to run, and, and I'll show that, that improves it a great deal. But out of the box, it's not bad. Yeah, and, and is there a, the possibility where the LLM could actually validate the cipher uh, query itself? It's like, so some type of the ability to, to go back a few times until, until, the, query, until the cipher yeah, so query is correct. What we, what we tend to do with that is actually, so be, once you've actually had the query generated, then for us it's rule-based. It, we don't go back to the LLM and say, hey, does this look like correct cipher? What we do, though, is after we, well, okay, there's a couple extra things about making sure that it's not a destructive query, all those kinds of things come into play. You have to make sure security is there, fine. 
But once you run the query and you get the result back, you never hand that straight back to the user. There is another round trip with the LLM saying, hey, given this question, is this a reasonable answer? Because it could be syntactically correct, but semantically useless, right? And so that happens as well. Um, and so you've got to put in extra you know, round trips for that. Thank you. Uh, how, okay, so uh, my question is, uh, so say like if I have a book, like Shakespeare's book, right? So how do you um, extract the, uh, the graph structure, like which node link to and which node, and do the chunking? So because I imagine that uh, natural language is more complicated than the, the financial form, right? Because financial form, somehow I, I can uh, uh, observe the relation. Yeah. And the sec my second question is that, um, what's the typical criteria, criteria? So if I want to shard a graph database, so I mentioned graph database is a bunch of nodes and the edges, right? Yeah. So it's like you can do, do an auto sharding or it's like a, a user can choose the sharding criteria. Yeah, yeah that's so my question. Th Thanks. That, that, that's a great, those are both, both great questions. Uh, so starting with the kind of more, uh, I'll call it prosaic, you know, text, like the free, truly free-form text where there is no inherent structure or IDs you can ha hold on to or anything like that. Um, you, you're right, like, that is harder to do well than something that has some inherent structure, like hidden structure, I guess, inside of it. You do still start with just basic chunking and try to get for the text you've got, is it a paragraph level or a sentence level, and you let that be driven by the kinds of questions you want the user to ask rather than, so a lot of the chunking strategies started with like being very sensitive to um, token count, right? As token count goes up, okay, nobody cares anymore. Like that's not really a thing. What becomes the overriding factor is not token size, but like how relevant the similarity search ends up being. So it's very dependent on like what the embedding model is that you had. That will help determine what the chunk size should be for freeform text. So there's that aspect of it. And then still kind of for, for generating the graph around it, for constructing the graph around it, you start with the kind of linked list that I had. That's always going to be helpful. You also probably have chapters. You probably are like something of a hierarchy as well. Do that as well. And then it's name density recognition. Then it's you know using the LLM for a really great NLP pipeline. Go through, figure out the people, places, and things. Pull those out. And again, potentially use that for page rank or other clustering algorithms or whatever might be interesting, depending on what the text is that's useful. But you end up still elaborating on it but it's not as nice, I guess, is your point, and I agree with you, like as, as a legislation where you have like very specific citations, like this refers to subparagraph five of section whatever, like okay, that's super, that is a thing that is awesome. You're not gonna get that in the Iliad or, or something, right? Um, oh, and then for, for, uh, for basically graph size, right? Like, like what, what does scaling look like? So uh, graph partitioning is uh, not easy, is the fair thing to say? Like static analysis, you can kind of figure out how to partition a graph reasonably. The thing is even if you did static analysis and tried to partition a graph, you want to partition it so that it's partitioned well for queries that are asked. Because the whole reason for partitioning is usually spread across machines and have a lot of parallelism going on, right? When you're running queries that have to hop across machines, that sucks. And so you want your partitioning strategy to be driven by the questions you're asking. That ends up being in production like kind of a non-starter, like because the, even like ignoring Gen AI, like the, the things that people do with graphs always cut across too much. And so there's no perfect partitioning algorithm. The approach that we're taking now that is, this is being recorded, so I'll say like going to be available sometime. Um, I won't have my product people scream at me. Okay, the, what we're looking at now is actually th still thinking about partitioning, but having it be rule-based partitioning. So it's basically at the data modeling level, like as you know you're getting a bigger data set, you can say, actually, I know we've got a geographic split. And like there's a bunch of data that's in North America, a bunch of data that's in Europe, a bunch of data that's in Asia, wherever it might be. Those might have cross connections, but it's so rare that it's okay to have those in different places. And so you go ahead and do that. So you end up kind of determining on your own what is the reasonable split. It ends up usually being geo or time or some natural kind of partitioning that you decide, and then on a rule-based level then, pre-decide what those rules are, then it can actually get um, distributed. And I think, and again, product people, I apologize if I'm over-promising here, even scaling within those as well, you can have like scaling rules for how elastic the storage might be for like how many 
So for the, you know, for, you know, if Europe is going to go crazy, can we scale that up infinitely or not? Rules end up applying there as well. So at the moment, uh, that's not available. That, that is a, a future amazing thing that's going to happen um, probably next week, right, product people? <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, maybe we'll uh, let Andreas show us okay. the demos. And before he does that, I just want to add something in defense of the Iliad. The Iliad has canonical number of paragraphs. So oh. scholars can refer to them, which is better than most other texts, right? Yeah. So just, just to, to add that. I need, I need a better. Alice in Wonderland, I should have said. Well, no, it's probably got structure. Oh, damn it. <laughs> all right. Probably let's, all let's look at the demos. OK. Um, OK, right. This is when we watch the how I've broken my code. Um, oh, wait. I've got to change my sharing. I do that by stopping sharing and then sharing the whole screen, I guess. I do that. OK. Ah. There we go. Uh, so that GitHub repository that was on that slide there for a while, that's, this is one of the notebooks at the end. Those notebooks go through do, doing the construction. Um, there's another uh, bunch of notebooks that do some experiments. This is the last ex notebook in the bunch that is not currently in sync with the, 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 the data model, but it goes through a couple of different techniques of like how you can actually access a, a knowledge graph, what that looks like in code. Here I'm using Langchain. It's pretty much the same with llama index or anything else you might want to use. Um, again, Ray, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out, how that works with Ray, get that going as well. Standard stuff at the top here, um, bringing some stuff from Langchain, connecting to the database. Um, I add a little extra, you know, let's just make the responses when you get them back look nice. This was set up to be with OpenAI or Olama. Okay, this is the first part. Um, and this is Langchain specific. So Langchain has support for Neo4j that makes it look like a vector store. Um, this is the simplest possible thing you can do with Neo4j that doesn't take advantage of any graphiness. It is just treat it like it's a vector store. Fine, that's great. You get to specify how to connect to Neo4j. Nothing too clever is going on here. So this is straight up just run vector search, get responses back um, for this, this bit here of Langchain that we set up. So I set up a chain for that and I prettify it. Awesome. Um, I'm not going to run through these. So you can imagine you can run, you can see the examples that I ran while I was sitting on the couch. Okay, that works um, for, for better or worse. This is what the, the vector search, I talked about the, the query window that you can have, the context window. It looks like this. In, in Langchain, um, I think it's called a retrieval query that you can add as one of the parameters when you're creating the Neo4j vector class. Um, actually, I guess I could just look down and see what it is here. Yes, it's called retrieval query, right. So this bit up here um, is the, let me make that a little bit bigger even. And get rid of that x. So the retrieval query ends up working by assuming that a vector search has already happened. And as a result of the vector search, what you get back is the nodes that were found, what their scores were. Um, and then here, uh, there's a parameter called window as long as window that I'm going to pass forward. Um, we order them and then collect chunks around it. Wait, where did I go here? OK. The pattern matching that's going on here is not super awesome. It is just kind of straightforward, just find stuff around what, where you are, collect that all up. I collect the text from all the chunks, put that all into like, here's a bunch of chunks together, hand that back along with the store and, and the metadata. Um, it's not super exciting, but it gets the job done. That is, though, the part, this is like this retrieval query parameter here. Here I'm just using it for the, um, the, the context window expansion. This is the same part at which if you had multiple agents, for the different agents, like agents who knew about how to answer different kinds of questions, this is where their strategy can come in. Like you can still do a vector search, but then after you've done the vector search, you can do like post ranking based on a, a pattern, or you can expand the context window based on a pattern. Anything you can do with a query language, you can do right here. So if you have the unstructured data and the structured data all connected, this is the part where you kind of inject that extra functionality. Here I'm just doing the, the chunk window. Okay, I'm going to prettify that. Um, and I, I mean, I could just, let me see if this actually runs again. Have I lost any connectivity? Oh, okay. Okay, and so here are the two results. Um, is one better than the other? They're different for this context. 
doesn't really seem to make much of a, a, a difference. It doesn't improve or not. You can decide if you like one or the other better. This is a sort of decision where it so, so depends on what the text is that you're querying, whether having a context window is really important or not. The sort of, the anecdote I always like to come up with here with, that isn't really real world, obviously, is like the MacGyver, you're defusing a bomb scenario. And like, hey, how do I, which, which wire do I cut first? Oh, vector search, cut the red wire. The next chunk says, but first, boom, right? Okay. You, <laughs> You kind of want both of those chunks to come back. You want to make sure you get the full context. And like, because text is imperfect, people's, you know, don't always go through nice sequential order of things. So you want to make sure you've got enough. Here, it didn't really make much of a difference. You can decide which one's better. Um, this is a bit of more expanded. And actually, this is the part that I think is not in sync with the model at the moment. This is another retrieval query where instead of just expanding the chunk window, I'm reaching out into the investment portfolios and saying, okay, given this chunk that I found, I know that that came from some form, that form was filed by some company, that company has some investors. So from the chunk, follow the pattern all the way back to the investors, package all that up into text, pass it to the LLM, let it answer questions. If somebody happens to ask about investors, you can now answer those questions. And, and by, by combining them as well. So I guess importantly, like, so the the flow here still ends up being anchored in vector search. So if you know there's a company that uh, is at risk from chip shortages because they'll have to say something like that in their filings, right? Vector search will find those companies, and then you can say, okay, which investors are have portfolios that are exposed by a chip shortage? That ends up needing to go from the companies that are ex exposed by the chip shortage through to their investors. This is when a question like a, a query like this ends up being valuable. Um, same thing as package that up to LangChain, add that to the, the things that I can run, um, and then go ahead and let it run. Oh, right, yeah, and I ran this before, and that's when I was sitting at the couch thinking, what have I done? This does not work because I've broken the data model um, and not updated the queries. So um, later tonight, um, maybe it'll be a race. You guys can go and uh, fork this repo and try it out, and if it's still broken, then you can yell at me, but I'm going to try to tonight go get this fixed. Um, so that you can wake up in the morning for sure, and these queries will be a little bit better. Here's the full kind of let's do the full like text to cipher example. This is a giant prompt that is basically saying, okay, at the beginning here, it's the usual kind of thing. Hey, you're really good at writing cipher queries. You know about writing cipher queries. Here's a schema that I'm going to tell you about. Don't do anything other than writing cipher queries. And by the way, here's some examples of what you can do. Uh, this first example I, I love, I threw this in because it felt like something you'd want to be able to ask if you didn't know what's possible. You're like, hey, wh what do you know about? Like, okay, you're, you know about companies. What companies do you know about? As a pattern match, that's simply match a pattern for companies and then, you know, okay, return just 10 of those things randomly. Not, it's a very poor way of, I guess, doing that. It's not comprehensive, but it's an example of something that's easy to write in a query, in a query language query that a natural language query doesn't really, you're not gonna find that in the text anywhere. So okay, that's what that looks like. Continues like with Hashmark, which city in California has the most companies listed. As we know, LLMs are really great at understanding this California here, whoops, there, ends up being the California that I'm using here in a predicate. There's a where predicate after here. This is a bigger pattern from a company that's located at an address where the address.state is California. Return that address, you know, count how many cities are there. So, wait, count the number of cities is the number of companies, and then order descending. So that ends up getting uh, the, the top companies that are in California. And this goes on. So this, this I have like, I don't know, uh, a handful, 10-ish or so. Oh, I do, yeah, right. I end up, so all the things that I talked by through in the early slides, like let's take advantage of full text. Let's take advantage of doing geospatial search. Let's take advantage of vector search and pattern matching all in different combinations. I ended up coming up with different example questions and then what the queries would look like. These are the kinds of queries that, particularly like even like the, um, like this here is the point at distance. That's doing a geospatial uh, index lookup and then just doing a, a distance calculation. That, I've never got that to be auto-generated from a text to cipher uh, 
you know, just ask the LLM to do that without any kind of help. Um, so that's a good one to actually prompt it with. Um, but it goes through here all, all those different things. And then at the end, I'm like, okay, here, for the how many do I have, the four or five different strategies. For any question I ask, let's run all the strategies, see what the answers actually look like. Uh, and this is kind of hilarious, as, as these things always are. Okay, so that one that I said earlier was a really easy pattern to match for. Okay, what companies do you know about? I, I know that these first two are lying, because I know like in the small, I, this is a small sample data set that I have, and it does not talk about um, Freshworks, for sure. Um, I think News Corporation is there, Alphabet is not there, ServiceNow is not there, Page, like, so these, I don't know whether this is being, you know, how this is being hallucinated, but it is being hallucinated at this point. So it has, I probably would benefit from some prompt engineering to help rein it in a little bit. But because I've also broken some of the other pattern match stuff, these two things come up with, I, I don't know. Um, actually, I'm sorry, right, this, this bottom one is not going through the pattern match, the retrieval query. This is the text to cipher with few shot learning because I basically told it how to answer this question this time, and not, it doesn't always happen. This time it actually, you know, took me at my word, ran that query, got the answer, and this is true. All those companies mentioned there are, are in the data set. Um, and then you can go on and ask other questions. This is, I'm not gonna go through all of them if you'd like to. I would love it if you guys actually uh, tried these notebooks out and tell me what's broken about them. Tell me what you like about it, what's missing. Ask me, like, how would you do X, Y, or Z? Um, because the reality of going down this rabbit hole is really kind of is a rabbit hole. It really is a question of, you can keep adding to the corpus of questions that are possible, but probably you're gonna end up with lots of different strategies for answering different kind of classes of questions. And so it's not, it's not an overnight thing, it's a, a continually evolving thing um, driven by need for the most part. So I'm gonna pause there and see if there's any more questions about what I've done so far. Oh, oh. There, there, there's a mic headed your way. Hold on. All right. Thank you. Um, so I have a question regarding the demo. Um, yeah. I remember there's a you know um test to cipher query about like finding the companies that are you know um close to Santa Clara, right? So um, oh, yeah. here for yeah. this qu uh, query, I was wondering why do you have to use two different matches? Well, the first one is to get the you know the address there that has a city equal to Santa Clara. But I mean, what if you simply use one you know match clause here to compare the um, address of the company to the location of Santa Clara? That's a great question. And so I guess it depends on, this is part of the, uh, I guess, subjectiveness that comes into like designing this stuff. Like here, my assumption was, because you can do exactly what you said, because we do have, in the graph itself, in the graph structure, there is an address that has a city that is Santa Clara. So it's just a simple set pattern match. Go from, you know, company that's at Santa Clara, management, and like, and you're all done. But it depends on what you mean by near Santa Clara. Like, and geographically, I'm gonna be at a little bit of a loss here, but like, you know, what's within 20 kilometers of Santa Clara? You've gone outside of the city limits at that point, but if you still consider that to be nearest, like, so if nearness means, you know, within an hour's drive, right, or, you know, some, something like that, like, then it is no longer something that's easily answerable through the pattern match. Um, it is easier to do than a geospatial match for that, so a geospatial index look up for that. Although, that said, there's nothing stopping you from actually popping up a level and being like, here's the county that Santa Clara is in, and like, let's find things that are in the county because that's nearby. Then you get into border questions of like, if you're at the border of the county, is a company across the, the border near you or not, right? And so it, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, but I mean, for the first query, what, I guess that there are like probably tens of thousands of address that test within Santa Clara. And I think, I mean, in terms of scalability, is it going to make this query super complex, you know, uh, when it comes to, you know, how things are run in the back end? Uh, because of the number of addresses that you have on hand? Is, is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. So, 
yes and no, I suppose. It depends on like exactly how granular you end up being and how you end up mapping. Like so if right as it is in this data set, I just have one address node and it is assumed to basically be a city level of, of granularity. Oh. If you want to get down to street level granularity, you could do that, but at some point you do have too many nodes and it's no longer useful because now you're doing a scan rather than a pattern match and you're kind of losing the ability of it. And you probably want to switch to what ends up mounting to either you go like with a pattern match that jumps up to a higher level, like go to the city and then come back down, um, or just run the geospatial indexing because it's some level of granularity. That's why the index is there. It's easier to do. It's kind of, it's not dissimilar from like what ends up happening with full text or vector search or anything else. There are always trade-offs. Like the reason you have indexes around for doing stuff is your assumption is, the assumption is, that you have so much data that an index is a specialized data structure for helping kind of sort through and find the window of stuff of what you want. Sometimes the inverse is true, where actually you know enough about the where you want that the index does not help you as much as just going through the things that you know about. Um, and so you have, you already constrained the problem set, right? And now it's, it is, scanning is not as expensive as you thought it might be, and doing a scan is not bad because you can, if you can fit it all in memory. So for the first match across, does it only return the city level addresses? In, in this data model, it does, yeah. Oh, I get it. Yeah, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, wait, yeah. And so I, I wasn't clear about that. Like, so when we pulled out the addresses here, the address nodes do not get any finer than city level. Okay, that, makes, data set. that totally makes that sense. That was the part that I, oh, sorry, yes. Got you, the answer to my question. Cool. Other questions? I'm just curious if there's, um, if you have any LLMs that have been fine-tuned to generate accurate uh, cipher queries. There's some that do better than others. Uh, I know that, I know that we have a team internally who's uh, constantly trying to evaluate that. I don't know what the current best recommendation is. The generic recommendation always is, you know, uh, use Mixtral basically or something at that scale and then go down based on what the queries actually look like. like the abilities will change. Um, we are internally not only evaluating models, but also trying to do some fine tuning of our own and uh, come up with our own model that is specifically for Cypher. Right product people, that'll be available next week. <laughs> so not, not, not yet available yet, but it is, it's something we're trying to tackle. Um, one of the challenges there ends up being as often, like there's not enough just kind of sample data that we have to do the training super well. Um, so it's limited in its effectiveness, I think right now. For, for zero shot, what, uh, which LLM would you recommend? Zero shot or few shot? So I'm pretty lazy. I do not mess around with a bunch of different models myself right now. So I'm pretty happy actually with GPT-3.5. I find for like most, most out of the box works fine. Um, so I don't, I don't bother uh, looking around for the best yet. But if you'd like to know, I'm happy to ask the folks who are spending time looking at that and I'll, I'll let you know what they recommend. Hi. Um, yeah, I had a question about the when you're inferencing how you're processing the the text chunk data. So I think someone mentioned dimensionality reduction earlier, and I, I wanted to ask because it's an important question. Um, like when when you're processing this text chunk data, do you do any any techniques like you know principal component analysis where you're looking at the textual data and um, you know trying to identify you know across um, what, identify the components which have the highest degree of variance and then mm -hmm. use those components to bring it down from like, let's say 100 dimensions down to two or three dimensions to speed up the queries and be able to inference on lower dimensional data. Yeah, so I have, I have to admit like, I don't have a lot of variety of experience in that. I know the, the customers that we have who are doing this stuff spend a lot of time at that step trying to figure out what the right strategies are for how they can actually figure out what to put in chunks and like what the embedded model is for the chunks and also like what they can derive from those chunks at, at different granularities to actually have useful graph structures around them. The, this whole, that first stage is, it affects all the, everything else you end up doing. Like if you, if you get that done really well, then the query complexity goes becomes better or worse depending on what you've done there. Yeah, definitely. Like, like, like the other person said, I think it is a lossy transform, but it can definitely speed up the queries, like you said, because you're you know, inferencing on much lower dimensional data. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. Thank you. Makes sense. Other questions? Any questions from this wonderful annex? You guys have been silent? No? All right, making sure. Okay, if no more questions, then let's thank Andreas for the great presentation. <laughs>